today, but what you see in front of you are some examples that will serve their purpose throughout the video to answer a question from Desiree Grace, which is, well, I'm paraphrasing, how to grow bushy orchids. Now, this is a question that all orchid aficionados will have at one point in time. Whether it is to eventually share the orchid with someone that has mentioned that they like the orchid or because it does so well in our environment, requires minimum care and we want more of it. So basically, let's talk about growing bushier orchids. And in order for that to happen, if at all, because you know, orchids, <laughs> we need to address the subject of propagation. There are several ways to get bushier orchids, but, and there's that word again, a constant in the orchid hobby, but it can take time because orchids do not grow at the same rate as other plants do. Granted, some orchids grow faster than others, but still they are slow to respond to whatever we do before they become bushy. And first of all, we need to make sure that we are starting off with a large orchid. I know, right? We want bushy orchids, but now we need a large one before we can even grow a bushy orchid. Make that make sense, you say? <laughs> okay, I'll try and do that. Just stick with me. <laughs> it is important to start with a large orchid because in order to ensure that our orchid in question can deal with what I'm about to suggest, we need to make sure that the orchid in question has enough energy, has enough structures to handle the intervention so that eventually it will grow bushier. When we speak about how much energy an orchid has, that refers to how many structures does the orchid have for it to be able to sustain its growing point as well as register that there is an opportunity to start a second growing point further back on the rhizome. Because without taking the orchid out of the pot, that's part and parcel of the point of a bushy orchid, we can cut into the rhizome, not all the way through, but halfway and cause a stress point. This triggers the hormones in the orchid that the connection to the front lead has been interrupted, and that means everything in the back is going to decline if it doesn't hustle and get its own growing point in order to continue to survive. As long as the rhizome is intact, the older part will just function as the humps of a camel do. They are storage and energy providers for eventualities of drought, some climactic interferences that doesn't deliver what the orchid needs at a specific time, and they will become the lifesaver of the orchid throughout those eventualities. Any older structures, they just sit there, functioning, but they have the potential to become a contributor to increasing the size of the orchid when the flow to the front is interrupted to a degree, and that is referring to the flow is interrupted to a degree. The fact that older structures of the orchids have the potential to becoming a contributor to increasing the size of the orchid is true. The reason I say that it is best not to cut the rhizome in its entirety, although that is an option, but if avoidable, then it is safer to leave a little of the rhizome attached. And the reason I say that is because if there are old roots at the back end, even if they are on their way out because of age, they are still functioning to a degree. But those roots will only last for so long to maintain the energy within the back end. If there is still a little bit of a connection, a lifeline to the front of the orchid with active young functioning roots, chances are higher that through the part of the rhizome, the back end will still get some support before the hormones start with a new growing point. And eventually the orchid may, but more often than not, grow a new growing point. If you ever want to test this out, try it on a hybrid because they are easier than species. A hybrid, even without a viable eye in the back to activate, will find a way to create a new growing point because they're a little bit more vigorous and also possibly a little sooner than a species would. 90% of species orchids are so much slower growing unless they are in a primary hybrid or have been used for hybridization with another orchid that is more vigorous. And based on the hybrid example, sooner and easier are all relative, of course, because it can take two years for the back end to respond to the cut. Now, in the event that your rhizome is somewhat buried, how can you figure out how deep your cut into the rhizome should be without actually severing the whole thing from the rest of the orchid? 
Just scoot away part of the media to expose the rhizome. Then you get a clear idea of its circumference and cut halfway through. The sharpest knife is a must for this because you don't want to be opening any jagged wounds that could cause possible pathogens to enter the cut area and be brave. You can also take a pair of secateurs and take the very tip of it and nick the rhizome without going all the way through. And be brave and do it with assertiveness. <laughs> if you're unsure how much pressure to apply, touch the rhizome and feel how strong it is, how tough it is against your finger. That gives you already a little bit of insight as to how much pressure you need to apply for when you make the cut. Rhizomes can be really tough, even though we can easily break them when it comes to cutting them through the fiber crosswise, they can be as strong as a dried out twig. Once you've found your cutting point, don't hesitate while you slice into the rhizome, stop halfway. Now, the wound needs to be sealed even though you didn't cut all the way through. It needs to dry off and you need to insert something to accelerate the healing and prevent bacteria from entering. Also, no water should get anywhere near that area until it has completely dried out. When I used to do this in the past, seeing as the cut will not leave a gap worth pointing out, I used to take a name tag, dampen it with a wet cloth, not to the point of dripping wet, but wet enough to hold on to the cinnamon powder on both sides and then I would pry the rhizome at the point of the cut apart and with the powder cinnamon stuck to my damp name tag, I would then slide that into the cut and the rhizome will pop right back into place, closing around the name tag, leaving the cinnamon easily to just do its thing without it being wiped off prematurely. And then you have something that looks like this for a while. Of course, a little bit deeper because it would be somewhat sunken down into the cut. Also, in doing this, you will have a visual reminder as to where the cut is. And when you water, you will know to stay clear of that area. How long you leave the tag in will depend on the season you're in and how much humidity you have in your grow space. But if it doesn't bother you, leave it in for as long as possible, even if it is months or at least a week to 10 days to be on the safe side. All right, we're starting to get into some examples now. So thank you very much if you're still here. So let's get back to having a large orchid to begin with. Another reason this is important is that it is always advisable to have a minimum of three structures, pseudobulbs behind the cut, if possible more. Bearing in mind that we need to make sure that we are not reducing the amount of structures that are then left at the front end of the orchid. So based on the rule of thumb, before cutting into a rhizome, an orchid should have a minimum of six structures and the cut would ensure then that there are three mature ones at the front, preferably with a new growth already starting and three at the back. But there's that word again. When it comes to some orchids with thin structures like my Lelia perinii, those thin structures, if left with only three on either end, will not sustain the orchid long enough to create a new growing point because there is not enough energy in them. They are not large enough and that has to be taken into consideration as well. How large are the structures and is the orchid a slow growing one in the first place? Because if it is a slow grower, then the structures will not be able to do what they are supposed to do based on the lack of energy reserves. For Mylalia perinii, I divided her. I had five structures in the back when I divided her and it did start a new growth, but then the whole thing collapsed the division in the back. So my mistake was actually dividing the orchid. I separated the back completely from the front and tried to grow it on. That did not work, even with five pseudobulbs to work with. Should I attempt that again, I will leave the orchid in the pot and slice the rhizome and see if that works better. But look here, in 2020, I divided my happy holiday and two years later, I have the back end growing a new lead two years and this is a hybrid. If I had left the orchid in the pot, it may have only taken one season being a hybrid, but that is not a guarantee either. 
still, within two years, this orchid now has two leads and it will probably take another year for the new lead to bloom. Here you see my Sunya Green mailman. After two years of a division, nothing happening, no new growing point at the back end of my orchid and nothing on my golf green hair pig either. The reason you don't see many bushy orchids in my collection is because I have to make divisions of my orchids as I am limited with my indoor space come the winter time. I have specific pot sizes that I have to take into consideration. Otherwise, I would be growing all my orchids on to match the pot size of my CG Roebling. <laughs> All right, let's look at my Sunya Green Mailman just to give you an indication of what I'm talking about, how many structures and where to cut the rhizome while the orchid remains in the pot without forfeiting what is already a beautiful new growth at the front. Let's count the growths. That includes a leafless one. It is a structure, it is a source of energy. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus a new growth. Perfect. If I wanted to increase the bushiness of this orchid and have the space, the capacity and time, then I have plenty of structures where I can do this. So my cut would be one, two, three, four. That's already one more than what I would need as per, you know, three being the rule of thumb. It would leave me with four in the front, which is also very generous as per our rule of thumb with three structures in the front plus a new growth. So if I were to cut this orchid's rhizome, one, two, three, four, it would be straight down the middle and it would be right here. And then halfway through, and you can see the thickness of the rhizome. The circumference is approximately like one centimeter. And I would just cut, pry the rhizome open, stick my tag in there that has been coated with cinnamon, wedge it into that gap, release the rhizome, and let the rhizome hold on and squeeze into the tag and let the cinnamon do its thing. This is a great candidate. Plenty of structures plus a new growth coming, and there is plenty that would then still sustain the back if there were to be any viable roots still in the back that are somewhat on their way out. There could still be energy flowing through the rhizome to the back part, and then care as per normal and watch and wait for the magic to happen. While we're on the subject of rhizomes, before I go to another example how we can get bushy or orchids, look at my Rincolalia digbiana. She looks nice and bushy. She's got lots and lots of growth, but we have to take a really close look if we were to cut into the rhizome of this orchid because bushy doesn't necessarily mean that we have enough structures to work with when it comes to cutting the rhizome. So we need to look into the back and see what is the orchid actually doing from the back end moving forward. And we will very, very quickly recognize that this is one orchid that has branched into two leads since it arrived in my collection. This is important because there's two rhizomes in this pot. You can see there's one going along this way and there's another one creeping through the back, like to forward going this way. And if we were to count these different structures on these two separate rhizomes, we only have one, two, three, four, five, six. And yes, three in the front, three in the back, the cut could be right here, but it hasn't even started a new growth yet. We could get away with it. It's starting new root production, but this is not a bushy orchid. This is one orchid with two separate growing directions. So take that into consideration. When you look at your orchid, you're not going by how many structures you've got in the pot. You're looking at how many structures are connected to a single rhizome. The second lead has six as well. So the cut, if we were to do that, would be right here. This is not the time to be going in just because we see a lot of structures in a pot. We don't have a new growth, even though we have new roots. So watch out what a rhizome is doing in the pot. And if it is branching with two separate growing points, go back to the beginning, to the end, wherever, however you want to see that, and count your structures before doing anything when it comes to cutting a rhizome. Don't let the amount of leaves in a pot fool you. The rhizome is our point of reference but not all the time because you can see more candidates in the back there. So let's go to those and see how we can get bushier orchids with another option. 
Another one of my favorite ways to get bushio orchids, and this goes much faster than doing any cutting of rhizomes in the pot, is by propagating keikis. On the screen, you're seeing Dendrobium kingianum right here. Those are keikis from Fernanda, Nathimento orchids, and succulents. I have keikis going on back there on my Dendrobium berryoda, and here is a pot full of Dendrobium nobili, a complex hybrid, typical commercial thing, but it is very, very generous when it comes to producing keikis in the first few years of having it in your collection. So getting an orchid to get bushier much faster is to save the keikis of the orchid and pot them up in the same pot or just add them to an existing mount. Once they are ready to be removed from the mother plant with roots long enough for them to grow on as individual plants. Seeing as these keikis then turn into seedlings, once they are detached and potted up, it will take a couple of years before they mature to bloom on their own. But these kinds of orchids really promote results in creating a quick fix bushier look in the pot or on a mount than any of the rhizome orchids that I just showed you just now. This can happen from one year to the next, and then in three years, you will get those keikis to bloom unless you have a Dendrobium nobili, which will bloom on keikis from a season prior. This pot has five Dendrobium kingianum keikis in it, all in the same pot, even though they're babies. I so far only have one new growth coming from one of the keikis. Imagine if all the keikis in this pot were doing the same thing, I would already have 10 more structures sticking out, even though they're all separate, but it makes for a quick, bushier plant in the pot. And I spy with my little eye Why we're filming. Check this out. There's a new growth coming here from this little keiki back there. And oh my goodness, the smallest keiki of them all, right there by the tip of my tag, has another new growth coming. This is awesome because now we are getting a much bushier looking pot and relatively quickly. Keikis are amazing. My Nobili has approximately five keikis in it from the first year that it was with me. I put them all back into the pot. So this looks like a massive mature orchid, but in truth, there's one main plant and the rest are keikis and they're just making the plant look that much bushier. It's fabulous. Bring on keikis and that is why I'm also developing my Aphyllum keikis because they are going to be making a big, huge mount, a lot bushier looking. Seeing as the original mount, all the keikis that I could harvest since I've had this orchid have already been pinned to the top and it's kind of full already. <laughs> You see, can't get enough of keikis. <laughs> they work perfectly and they are fast to bring results and make an orchid look bushier. Another suggestion, recommendation that will help to get bushier orchids and possibly the fastest of all three examples I am giving today is to focus on growing orchids that are just vigorous in their growth habit. And when I look at my Maxillaria variabilis, lovingly known as Cousin It, I did not even propagate the growth from that orchid to stick them into the pot for a bushier look because that one just grew like a beast and in two years it had tripled in size. Two years! The Maxillaria genus as species orchids go are super fast growers and you have yourself a bushier orchid in no time. Another genus is in your face right now, that is Prostechia. It's a genus of orchids that I find super vigorous and they will grow bushy in no time as well as in cyclias. This is Prostechia garciana alba. When I got it, it had four bulbs. It was a four bulb division from a nursery. It bloomed on the first new growth I had, and I was really proud of myself. And I had it mounted, and within two years of it being in my collection, I recognized that the mounted setup was just not going to match its growth habit, seeing as it was exploding in multiple directions year on year. And here we are only four years later, and it has come to this. A four bulb division in four years is in a 30 centimeter pot and it is in full Akadama, a highly water retentive media in a semi-hydro setup because of its vigor and in order to meet its needs adequately, 
<laughs> and it signs in four years, there's not really much more you can ask when it comes to getting a bushier orchid in your collection. And she is fragrant. So imagine also the bloom show of this orchid, the fragrance she exhumes, a very elegant talcum powder fragrance. It is a beautiful perfume, lots of blooms. They are fragrant, vigorous orchid. It's a species. Wow. I mean, talk about ticking all the boxes in getting bushier orchids. So, Desiree Grace, bushier orchids can be done, but to get it done safely without risking the loss of any part of the orchid in the pot, the orchid already has to be somewhat large in its own right so that each end has a chance to do what it has to do or keep growing as it is supposed to at the front. And that was in order of how quickly an orchid would respond to any intervention to become bushy. Some sympodial orchids with a rhizome will take a long, long time. And then you have the opposite end of the spectrum with a maxillaria genus or a prostechia genus or an encyclia genus that have rhizomes and they just go, who cares? Growth, 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 growth. <laughs> and then you have the cakeys. They will make your pot nice and bushy very, very quickly. It'll take some time for them to bloom though. Now that is my off the top of my head take on getting bushier orchids. And if anyone watching this video has any other suggestions for Desiree Grace on how to get bushier orchids, please add them in the comments. Also, if you would like to see where my divisions ended up from 2020, even ones that I have not mentioned in this video, in the description I have linked a video from the orchid room where she unboxes those divisions. There you will have them all consolidated in one video as opposed to the many videos I have dividing and repotting. <laughs> and Ariel, if you ever see this video, know that you are sorely missed and we all hope that you are doing well. Thank you Desiree for another super interesting question. Keep them coming! and for watching the video. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time and any possible suggestions you may have when it comes to how to get bushier orchids. I hope this video was helpful. If there was anything confusing, of course, please address that in the comments. I'll be very happy to clarify. Have yourselves a beautiful day on one condition though, that you please stay safe. I would love to see you in the next video. Take care, bye.